Today is a super multimodal video. I've got planes, trains, and automobiles for sure, but I've also got buses, metro, light rail, biking, and walking as we go from Carretero to Mexico City to see if we can make it on time for a very, very big game. It's all up next. This is City Nerd, weekly content on cities and transportation. As always, I love viewer suggested topics, but sometimes eh, I just want to go my own way. So I've talked about theoretical high-speed rail lines in the U.S. and Canada, but there's a distinct possibility lurking out there that the first true purpose-built high-speed rail line in North America will not be in the U.S. or Canada. My understanding is that Tren de Alta Velocidad between Mexico City and Carretero will go to construction right after the Tren Maya is complete. And I think that means there's a pretty good chance Mexico City to Carretero will be built in this decade. I'll spend more time diving into the documentation and sharing details on the project when we get to that part of the video. But let me just say at the outset that the generic math I use to think through the viability of city pairs for high-speed rail kind of goes out the window when it comes to this particular city pair. And that's because the other travel options are really, well, I don't want to say they're not good, but they're not super reliable. So what we're going to do today is compare four options for getting from Carretero to Mexico City. Bus, car, airplane, and high-speed rail. But I'm going to do it differently from my previous videos. I'm going to do this Groundhog Day style. I've got one person who's going to keep reliving the same day over and over, trying different ways to get from Carretero to Mexico City city until they finally get it right. So here's the setup. The date is June 30, 2026. It's a little before 9 a.m. and our main character, Teresa, is on her way to work. Teresa's an empty nester. She divorced her useless husband and her son, who she's still close to, moved into his own place. And now she's got the cute apartment near the center of town that she always wanted. Teresa held down a teaching job for most of the time she was married and raising kids, but she completely revamped her life when she got divorced, and now she's a docent at Museo de la Ciudad, the city museum, right in the heart of Centro Historico, just off the Jardín Guerrero, which is an easy walk from her apartment every day. And she really does love her job. Growing up, she always loved visiting museums, and she still does some painting herself. But there is one thing she cares about, maybe even more than she cares about art, and unfortunately, that's the Mexican national football team, El Tri. She kind of hates that she cares so much, but what can you do? You can't really choose who or what you love. You see, she was eight years old in the summer of 1986 when Mexico hosted the World Cup and El Tri made a run to the quarterfinals. And the whole thing just kind of imprinted itself on her brain indelibly. So that makes today, June 30, 2026, extremely difficult because in the summer of 2026, Mexico, Canada, and the U.S. are jointly hosting the World Cup and today, Mexico plays in the round of 16 in Mexico City. Honestly, she's kind of annoyed she even has to work today, but she rationalizes that maybe it'll keep her mind off the match, which is bound to be disappointing anyway. I mean, Mexico has exited the World Cup in the round of 16 eight times in a row, if you count 2022. So she gets to work a little before nine, and very first thing, the museum director pulls her into a meeting in progress with one of the museum's big benefactors. And this particular one knows Teresa is football crazy, and it turns out they have a ticket to today's match that's gonna go unused otherwise. The director says they're fine with Teresa taking the day off. It's gonna be super slow anyway with everyone watching the match. The problem is the match is at noon, which which is normally a super weird time to have a match in Mexico, but it's the World Cup and all the game times are synced up for the European broadcast market. The match is at Estadio Azteca in the southern part of Mexico City. Azteca was, I believe, the largest stadium in the world at one point. It's still the largest one in Mexico, and it's home to Club America and Cruz Azul for the time being. By the way, I have a pet peeve about sports franchises that name themselves after states, like the Tennessee Titans or the Arizona Cardinals, or multiple states like Carolina or New England, but I I kind of love the complete audacity of claiming an entire hemisphere for your club. As if legendary clubs like Boca Juniors or, I don't know, Inter-Miami Club de Football didn't exist. So Azteca is in a bit of a tough location if you're coming in from the north, but 
We'll talk about the logistics of getting there as we go through our Groundhog Day scenarios. So just to recap, it's 9 a.m. Teresa has a ticket to the match of her dreams. And now all she has to do is get to Estadio Azteca by noon. And with that, let's get into it. So Teresa takes the bus to Mexico City pretty frequently. She's got friends who live there. She goes to the museums when there's a new exhibit in town. So taking the bus is the plan on day one of Groundhog Day. There are a lot of operators running buses between Coretro and Mexico City, but Teresa is a loyal Primera Plus rider and Primera Plus runs buses every 30 minutes on this route. She orders a ride hail right away because, let's be real, transit in Coretro is not great, and she definitely wants to be on the 930 bus. So she buys her ticket on her phone while she's en route to the terminal. The bus is scheduled to depart at 930 and get in at 1220. In reality, the bus arrives late to Mexico City a lot of the time, but I'm going to assume the traffic is average or maybe even a bit light today. As it gets closer to game time, people aren't going to be on the road. So Teresa is actually hoping the bus gets in early. She knows she's going to miss some of the match, but she's hoping to at least get there for the second half. The bus gets in right on schedule though, and it's a five minute walk through the terminal to the Autobuses Del Norte Metro stop. For those of you not familiar, the intercity bus terminals in Coretro and Mexico City Norte are not like US bus stations. They're super nice, they're modern and clean, they have great food options, and the metro connection to Line 5 on the Mexico City end is super slick. Anyway, down at Azteca, kickoff happened right on schedule, so we're 25 minutes into the match. Because she visits Mexico City a lot, Teresa has a loaded metro card, so she gets on the first available train, which is at 12.25. Remember, the Mexico City metro has amazing frequency, and she takes it one stop to La Raza, and it's 12.27 now. It's a bit of a walk to get to the Line 3 platform for her next train. She would normally take it slow and enjoy the funky underground science museum they have along the transfer route, but she's in kind of a hurry today. When she gets to the Line 3 platform, I'm gonna say she catches the 12.32, which gets her into Hidalgo Station at 12.41. Let's just go ahead and say this trip on the Metro is a bit of an ordeal. In the past, I've compared the Mexico City Metro system to Paris, but Mexico City does not have anything like the RER, which would probably help here. Instead, Teresa still has two more train rides in front of her. She's got a two minute walk to the Line 2 platform at Hidalgo, and she catches the 1244 train that gets her into Tascania Station at 1.15. Down at the stadium, the second half has kicked off, and Teresa's already wishing she'd done things differently. And for the last leg of her interest city journey, she's catching the Joko Milko tram line. Somebody correct my pronunciation on that. And that comes at 1.20, and it gets her to the Estadio Azteca Station at 1.35. It takes her 10 minutes to walk from the tram station station, into the stadium, and to her seat. It's 1.45, and, well, at least she made it before the final whistle. As for how the match turned out, well, let's just say Teresa really wishes she'd gotten there sooner. Day two. It's 9 a.m. again. The bus didn't really work out, so she's gonna bite the bullet and drive. By the way, I submit to you that if you haven't driven or taken the bus into Mexico City from the north, you may not actually know what traffic is. It is absolutely insane. So Teresa's reluctant to do this, but traffic was lighter on Groundhog Day 1, so she's gonna give it a shot. Her son also works in Centro, and he drives, so she's going to sweet talk him into lending her his car. Parking in Centro is terrible, as it should be, and his car is at Estacionamiento del Carmen, which is a six minute walk, and I think this is one where an attendant needs to get your car for you. So let's just say it's 9:10 before Teresa is on the road. Google gives an appropriately wide range of potential travel times to Azteca. It's two and a half to four hours, and I'm going to assume today if falls right in the middle. Maybe a bit lighter on the way, but it's going to get crazy near the stadium with lots of security and road closures and detours. So I'm calling it three hours, 15 minutes to get wherever she's going to go to park. So let's say she enters the parking lot at 1225. Quick note that the route she's taking, the 57D, is a toll route. I'm not really going to add up costs here, but she's going to pass through a couple gantries that are going to slow her down and cost her about five bucks a pop. So let's say it takes five minutes to park 
It's 12.30, but she had to park pretty far from the stadium because she got there so late. So it's a 20 minute walk to get into the stadium and get to her seat. So it's 12.50 and she did a lot better this time. Yeah, she missed the first half, but she's gonna be able to settle in for the whole second half. Still though, the way it played out, she still wishes she had done things differently. Okay, day three, and we're just gonna say her alarm clock goes off at the same time every day. She can't get the ticket before 9 a.m. And this time she's gonna just go all out and try to fly down there. Buying a plane ticket an hour before your flight is probably ruinously expensive, but this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. So it takes three minutes to grab a ride hail and Coretro's airport is not super conveniently located. It's gonna be about a 40 minute ride. It's 9.43 when she gets to the airport. In the car, she manages to buy a seat on Aeromexico flight 2461, departing at 10.22. I realize this is cutting it close, but it's a small airport. So let's give her the benefit of the doubt and say she makes that flight. Flight lands and reaches the gate at Mexico City International at at 11.20, so I'm gonna say 20 minutes to disembark and get to the taxi stand. She's not messing with public transportation this time. So it's 11.40, still 20 minutes to kick off. I don't know how long it takes to get a taxi out of Terminal 2, but let's say there's a queue and it takes like five more minutes. I'll take the median travel time, which is 35 minutes, which means she's getting out of her taxi outside the stadium at 12.20. And it's 10 minutes to navigate her way into the stadium and find her seat. So it's 12.30 and there's still 15 minutes left in the first half. So she's done better on day three, but for reasons that will soon become clear, she still wishes she'd done it differently. Okay, before we get to day four and the new high-speed rail service, quick reminder to pay your respects to the almighty algorithm by leaving me your comments and topic suggestions, liking slash disliking this video, and subscribing if you enjoy nerdy content on cities and transportation. On to day four. Teresa's alarm clock goes off again. She walks to work, gets her game ticket. It's 9 a.m. again. But this morning she wakes up to an alternate reality where the Mexico City Corretero high-speed train has miraculously opened on time and under budget. We're gonna talk about the proposed high-speed rail line as we go through, and my primary source for this is the Manifestación de Impacto Ambiental, which is like Mexico's version of an environmental impact report. This is from 2014, and I believe it's still the authoritative study. I'll leave a link in the description. So let's start with the station location in Corretero. There's an existing rail line and a legacy station on the north side of the river, but the EIR proposes a new station to the east on the north side of the existing tracks and just east of Boulevard Bernardo Quintana. It's hard to say what the frequency will be when this thing gets built, but the EIR appears to at least contemplate 15 minute intervals. But to play it conservative, let's just assume trains that run on the half hour, and she uses her phone to buy a ticket for the 930 train. And yeah, this particular train would probably be booked up months in advance but let's not get too literal here. Teresa could get a ride hail to the station, but at this point she's kind of feeling like cars are cursed. And really, who can blame her? Transit isn't going to get her there in time. She'd love to walk to the station, but that's not going to get her there in time either. So guess what? It's time for bikes to have their moment. Corretro has bike share, and there's a station half a block away at Jardin Guerrero. It's a 15 minute ride to the station. Most of it's on this great protected bike lane by the river, so she's plenty in time for the train. Train departs at 9.30, and the EIR is proposing a 63 minute run on a 210 kilometer route. That's about 130 miles, which I consider less than an optimal length for high speed rail. But when the highway options are this unreliable, High-speed rail becomes a lot more competitive at shorter distances. Anyway, Teresa's train pulls into Buena Vista Station at 10.33, right on schedule. So she's making great time, and she could probably just catch a ride hail or a taxi and be all right, but she just doesn't want to risk getting stuck in traffic. And she's actually tempted to grab a bike share outside Buena Vista Station, but it's a long ride that would probably just cut the time way too close, and I don't think the service area extends to Estadio Azteca anyway. So she's going to take transit, but it's going to work out better this time because Buena Vista is more centrally located than Autobuses del Norte. She's going to skip the Buena Vista metro station and and walk 15 minutes to Revolucion. That's on line two, and let's say it's 
1050 when she gets to the platform. Line two runs every two minutes and there's a 1050 train that gets her down to Tascania station at 1124. Let's say it takes her like three minutes to walk from the line two platform to the tram platform at Tascania and she catches the 1128 tram which deposits her at Estadio Azteca at 1143. It's a 10 minute walk to get to her seat and she's there in time for the national anthem. She's done it. On day four, she finally got it right. Because what happened was in the 23rd minute, Diego Linus got the ball on the right wing, dribbled around three defenders, and then curled the ball into the top left corner. It was the only goal of the match. The crowd went completely bananas, and the whole remainder of the match was a super tense affair with Mexico defending valiantly at one end and searching for a second goal that never came on the other end. And that's football. You never know when the big moment's going to come. As for Teresa, she goes on to live to a happy old age, and she never, ever forgets the feeling of being in that stadium at that moment in the 23rd minute. And that's all I've got. I'll be back with a new topic next week. See you then.